up, sexy people? What's up, beautiful people? Um, thank you for tuning in to She Speaks Live. I am Nikki Gilbert Daniels, and this is that little podcast that I just decided that I was going to do because it ain't a whole lot of places in the world where we can have real conversations about real shit. You understand? Know and not have it be diluted. <laughs> Hello? Not have it be diluted uh, by... Um, mm-hmm. Things that don't necessarily help move the culture forward. I'm so excited about tonight. I'm so excited about the people that I have on the show. If I look a little preoccupied, it's just because I'm checking to make sure that we are live at all the places that I said we was going to be live. Um, Sometimes it turns out that we are not. And um, this is live TV. So the only way to do it is to check it while we're here. So let's see. It says my my stream is live, is not live on She Speaks Live. And where are we? We're live on Facebook, which is a beautiful thing. Um, and I think we're live on She Speaks Live now. We are. So we're live everywhere. We're live on YouTube. We're live on Facebook. And we are live on SheSpeaksLive.com, which is beautiful. So let me get into my introductions. I'm super duper excited. This, this lady is so incredible. Um, I remember being so proud to know her when I watched her mm-hmm. win week after week, yeah. after mm. doggone week on Showtime yeah. at the Apollo. Oh, Ladies on, and bro. gentlemen, this sister right mm. here, mm. Jessica Care Moore, is a poet. Mm. She is an activist. She has a stunning collection of poems. This book, We Want Our Bodies Back, is yes. one that we definitely want to support. It's a stunning collection of poems, internationally renowned poet, playwright, performance artist, and producer, Jessica Care Moore brings forth a searing offering of stanzas on race and gender in America, moving through the world as an artist, not only in a woman's body, but in a woman of color's body, and how the the way the world perceives one as black women is often Mm. physically and emotionally exhausting. Mm. Come on, show some love. Thank you. For the sister Jessica Carey (laughs) Moore. And next up, this brother right here. Oh, my goodness. The fact. Hold on. Let's get him right. Let's get him right. Let's get him right. Here we go. Uh, Boom. Derek Buckner. There he is. There he is. There he is. One of the smartest um, people in high school. He was the editor in chief of the Cody Times, which is our school newspaper. He also wrote for Eastern Michigan University. He is uh, an advocate I always see him posting something real raw and honest and, and straightforward on his Facebook page and his post. I'm honored to have him. I look back at some some articles he wrote, which we're going to talk about from uh, high school. Very powerful moments. Give it up for Mr. Eric Buckner. Woo, woo, woo. Hey, what's up? What's up? <laughs> and last, but certainly, up, certainly what's not going? least, he was Glad the Griffin. Thanks. Appreciate it. You're welcome, darling. You are welcome, Eric. So last but certainly not least, this man was the griffin to my mock turtle in oh, the Alice girl. in the Land of Wonder. Um, he in, he was a proud member of La Trope des Arts, one of the ones who came in and helped clean up the basement. We cleaned that up and made it a classroom. You see what I'm saying? Um, he is the host of Dishing Tea with Big Meech. He has been doing it since July 1st, 2009. So he's about to be doing it. How many years, Meech? 13, 13 I mean, no, years. It's, it's 11 years that we've been doing the radio show, yeah. He's about to be 11 years doing the radio show. But ladies and gentlemen, this is the crew, Cody High School Reunion 2020. Okay, it's not really hey. a reunion. <laughs> Cody, uh, <laughs> Cody. Cody you can do it. Yo, so yeah. let me put my um, Bluetooth on so that we don't have a lot of feedback. I know I told y'all to do it, so I got to do it myself. So first of all, I'm honored um, that you, lady and gentlemen, yeah. um, <laughs> took time out of your schedules to participate in this conversation. I had a little bit of a rant um, a couple days ago, right? And uh-huh. Eric and Jessica... You are largely responsible for this rant that I had okay. without even knowing, right? Yeah. right? And it's and it's just proof about how impactful mm-hmm. your words can be. Even oh my god, I don't want to say, but I graduated mm. in '88, so it's a long time. Mm. Um, and one of the things that stood out most was that both of you were such advocates at such a young age, right? Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. The the. School newspaper was sponsored by Ford Motor Company. Shout out to Ford. That's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Ford Motor Company and Detroit Free Press. Absolutely. 
um, big deal. So Eric, take us to high school. You were you were editor in chief first before before uh, Jessica. So yes. but, uh, otherwise it would be later. Just first. older, <laughs> well, just a little older. How about that? Not by much, Jessica. Not by much. <laughs> <laughs> so Eric, tell us what it was like being the editor in chief of an inner city schools publication, Cody Time. Okay. Well, we'd be remiss to even have this conversation if we did not mention our fine leader doing the school newspaper by the lane of Miss Nancy Presnell. Yes, Miss Presnell. Oh my God, yes. One of my favorite teachers at Cody High School who convinced me after looking at some of the things I wrote in my English class that, yeah, you should do the school newspaper because you have a way of writing that your fellow students will be able to uh, understand and relate to. Mm-hmm. Not to mention they'll kind of help get you out of your shell because, you know, in high school, I wasn't, you know, the robber guy I am now. <laughs> I was just <laughs> I was in class getting my grades and trying to stay out of trouble. But, uh, you know, she challenged me. So I took on the challenge and, you know, lo and behold, one day she was like, well, I think you should be the editor now mm-hmm. because uh, Lydia Whitehead, who was the editor before me, she yeah. had moved on mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, she felt like I was the best person for the job. So I did it and I am thankful because it led to so many other great things and opportunities in my life after that. That's awesome sauce. That's awesome sauce. So one of the things that I realized, I mean, you guys were writing about racism. You, does anybody remember the McDonald's incident? Do y'all remember yeah. Murder yeah. Mac? Yeah. The yeah. McDonald's Murder incident, Mac, right? So it blew my mind to see the school newspaper covering that. Mm -hmm. Jessica, Mm -hmm. um, you are such a beautiful, amazing, incredible writer and woman. (laughs) Thank you. And I'm so inspired by your fearlessness and what you put into the universe through your words. Thank you. What was it like being the editor in the high school newspaper? Take a (laughs) second. It was was awesome. I was like a super nerd, you know, like thank God for sports. (laughs) Otherwise, I just would have been nerded all the way out. Um, You know, and I, I, it's funny, I haven't, you bringing up the Cody test, I haven't thought about it, honestly, in years. Um, something I'm real proud of, though, my journalism teacher was, I don't know if he was there for y'all, but Mr. Perry was my journalism teacher. And, and he was lovely. He was the one that really, um, really told me that I should take the reins and, and found the writing to be good and, and pushed me into journalism. And I ended up going on to study journalism and political science at Michigan State University. So, and, and became a professional journalist before I became a professional poet. I was writing TV news for Channel 50 when I was just like 19 or 20 years old. And so, you know, I, I continue to do that work. Um, and I was so fascinated with telling stories as a, um, as a young girl, Mm -hmm. not just at Cody, but I remember even at seventh and eighth grade at my mother's um, apartment complex, I was like trying to interview the people that lived in the apartment complex and you know, (laughs) in my blood to like tell people stories. And so I do it with poetry now, but that Cody Times experience, I mean, Cody in general, that experience um, really shaped who I am. And I, I speak to it often, if not for, you know, Susan's story and that, and that black box theater. And, and that school newspaper, um, I wouldn't be who I am today. I, my my college experience didn't do that for me. I was already who I was by the time I got to Michigan State. You know what I'm saying? Right. I just, Ooh. Just sharpened the sword a little bit as I've gotten older. You know, but it, the foundation was there, Cody. Yeah, that that just hearing you say the foundation was established there is a powerful thing because um, the other part of, of of my rant was that I did some research and I discovered. That Cody had just become segre- desegregated, I'm sorry, 10 years, about 10 years prior to when I got there in 84. Wow. I'm yeah. Sorry, mm. Right, right, right. Yeah, about 84. Wow. Um, and that, well, yeah, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And when we talk about Miss Presnell and we talk about Miss Story and we talk about um, these amazing influences in our lives, they w- were white women. Yeah. They did not look yeah. like us. Right. They yeah, looked nothing correct. like us, but there was a genuine concern. <laughs> they loved mm-hmm. us. They yes. loved us. <laughs> Very mm-hmm. much so. They loved us. Meech. Yeah. Miss Susan Starry, honey. <laughs> they, they. That I lady love. to this day, when I say love, um, yeah. I said in my rant, wouldn't be where I am today without her, wouldn't have graduated, wouldn't have made it through high school. Period. period. I was not yes. the academic girl, I was the theater girl. Uh, Meech. What was your experience yeah. like in high school 
Um, you are very open about the fact that you are a gay black man, big, sexy, and yes. proud of it. Yes, yes, um, yes. What was Honestly. that like being under the tutelage of Ooh. Susan's story? Or just what was your high school experience like overall? Well, you know, uh, coming into Cody, I was uh, I started there. Uh, I was there for all four years, actually, except for two months, because the first two months I was over at Southeastern and I moved and then came over to Cody in my freshman year. In fact, Susan and I came over, Miss Story, we came over at the same time. OK, so that there was a beautiful thing. And you're talking about a, I was I was a 13 year old who was starting high school. So I was younger than most, you know, the 13 year old. Yeah, same here you know, bigger than life person. And it 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 was a rough because I was still at my coming out stages and carrying on. So uh, that whole high school experience was really something. I got challenged by the entire football team. You know, they wanted to fight and carry on. And I took on that challenge wholeheartedly because I was not going to back down. But when I came into the theater department, mm. That was when I realized what my voice was because I've always been a living in life personality. But <laughs> the reason why I got into theater was because it was the one class that I knew we can cuss. And I was <laughs> I, <laughs> getting my cuffing tops on, right? Let it out. Let yeah. it out. So I came into theater with that as the precipice. It's like, okay, well, hell, we can go up in here and we can cuss. And, you know, I could do this and I could do that and say and, and be mean. And what what happened from that experience had just opened up the world to me. Diana Ross said in an interview during the Mo, one of the Motown uh, landmarks, I think it was Motown 40. And mm -hmm. she said what very, very uh, Gordy did for her, he took a pebble and cast it into the water and it just had a wave and a ripple effect. And that mm -hmm. ripple is still going out um, onto the water. And that's what, what uh, Miss Story was for me because Absolutely. coming in, and, you know, we, we, when I, I get nostalgic watching Sister Act 2, because that was us. <laughs> that That's was. It was so us. us. Oh, my Literally. God. It was so us. Okay. See, and the fact that they didn't even give her a classroom. I was talking about this, and I put this big post out just honoring yeah. her. The fact that they were like, mm, you can't have no class. Drama. Remember, they gave her hell. They gave right. her hell. Right. And so many teachers were like, no. But the fact that she demanded that we had a certain GPA or we could not participate yeah. in her class, that's the yeah. only reason I maintained that little 2-5 or whatever it was. Right? right? Yeah. Because yeah. Two we five. Were, yeah. yeah. And it's just having people like Ms. Presnell, having mm -hmm. people like Ms. Story in a, in, a, in a space that was just desegregated not 10 years prior to that, right? Yeah. Uh, was just such right. a powerful thing because um, when I read, and I'm going to send you guys these articles, but mm -hmm. they broke my heart. Like there was a man who was quoted as saying, the, the, the issue was, and I'm sure you guys already know, but for the, for the people who are watching, shout out to people watching on YouTube, on Facebook, on Periscope, on SheSpeaksLive.com, NoEgo.TV. Thank y'all. We love you. We appreciate you. But I'm going to give y'all a quick rundown right quick. Mm -hmm. So Cody was a school that was pre predominantly white um, all the way up yeah. to like 72, 73. And then it was like 50, 50. Right. right so right. Mayor Coleman Young, a bunch of folks were like, listen, we need to de desegregate this school. What, what white people did was they voted to not increase property taxes. You know, that whole redlining thing started right. to happen. Right. right. And they're like, nope, we're not going to do it. We're not uh, putting more money into the pot. So as our parents who worked really hard to try to get us into a better neighborhood, I still remember I lived, I grew up on Mansfield and our mm. neighborhood was uh, still a large percentage. Of our, our neighbors are white. So, mm. you know, we had kind of mm -hmm. come up because we're like, you know, I guess it was ingrained in black people to believe that if black white people were in the area. Um, <laughs> right, came right, 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 right. I guess. Um, <laughs> so, so real quick and dirty. What, there was a man who was quoted as saying, if you think you're nuts, if you think that I'm going to pay more money so y'all can bust more niggas into this school, wow. you're nuts. Wow. wow. There were so many race wars. It. There was this incident where the black kids, when they started the desegregation, there was a group of black kids watching ROTC practice on the ROTC field. The mm. white teacher said, go away. You don't belong here. They mm. left. White kids came over with mm. like bottles and bats and started a whole thing police came they arrested the wow. black kids in spite of the principal saying 
the white kids were the agitators. So right. the short, short story is the school became very bad. The school became, well, I think the GPA was 1.6 and 85. We had the mm. McDonald's incident. Do you guys remember the guy who killed, that who died in the swimming pool? Yeah. There's a kid, you, we, um, probably, we block certain things out because we don't remember, but when yeah, you pull up right. these articles and you're like, what? Yeah, I don't know right. if you remember Tanisha Massengale me. Uh, Do you, you remember Tanisha Massengale? Yes. Mm. Yes. Sad to death. And we yeah, went to school. Yeah. The so we endured so much trauma, right. but we were still able to somehow make it mm. through. So I just want to talk a little bit about what's going on with the educational system today. Mm. We thought that it was like we all said in the beginning of this conversation, we thought it was cool. Jessica, mm. what do you yeah. see when you look at the Detroit public school system right now? Um, well, you know, so I've been I've been back in Detroit since my son King is 13 and wow. headed to high school. He's wow. uh, he auditioned for a piano audition for Detroit School of the Arts and got in on a piano audition. And see, so he's an artist. He's a little us. Um, and he's fantastic. But uh, my son, so I've, I was not able to put King into public. He's been in private school since preschool um, because he could oh, not wow. attend any public school in the city safely, in my opinion. And um, academically, it, there just wasn't a school that not in the elementary level to eighth grade um, to get him where he needed to be. Uh, so I've done a lot of mentoring since I've been home. I've been inside Cody in particular, of course, many times. I did murals in the school. Um, did poetry workshops in the school. I've spoken there many times. I've been in Western. I've been in DSA. I've been in a, a lot of the schools in the city. And um, it's really imbalanced and unfair. Like what's happened with this pandemic? Kind of everything that was wrong with Detroit Public Schools showed up. Like yeah. everyone already knew that there was a, a, a digital divide. Right. You know, my, my babies yeah. don't have... My son doesn't understand how privileged he is to have a iPhone and a computer. Like my, I'm talking about my babies that were juniors and seniors. They mm. don't have, they don't have, wow. they don't have, they don't. Have, if they have a smartphone, they got burnout phones. And then they have, they have, they have internet. It might be on their phone. They don't have internet at the house. So right. whereas like a mama like me, you know, I, I have to have the internet because of my the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And so, but they're not in those environments. They're environments where moms are working like kind of labor heavy jobs. And coming yeah. home late, and they don't need the internet. What you need the internet for? And so, right. Right. just now, now the Scaleman Foundation and the NAACP is like joined together. Now we're about to get our babies. All our babies are supposed to have laptops. Uh, and I say our babies because I love on these Detroit kids so hard, and I'm lost <laughs> to awesome them. They are my children. Uh, you know, Cody. You know, I wish I, Cody was a school that I could send King to, but it's absolutely not. And I remember going to the black box that was in Cody doing work as a as a dream director and asking about the the black box theater. I was like, so what's up with the the black box? And they were like, oh, the place where the the couches and the rats are. And I was like, that's what really. Oh, are you kidding? Wow. Oh yeah. And so I mean, it was it was a whole thing where I was like, Ooh. you know, I mean, maybe we can have this conversation. But I was really um, offline, but you know, interested in going in and like you know getting Cody to get that that space back together. You know, I was like, that, that, that black box theater and basement changed so many people's lives that I know, you know? Yes. And right now there's, you know, theater, theater, please. There's nothing that looks like Lake Truth Day's art. Detroit School of the Arts, the public school, my sister, Mama Magawa, Dr. Reynolds is the principal, which is why my child is going there. <laughs> that is the right, reason. Right, right. And she's doing revolutionary work because Detroit School of the Arts should be one of the best schools for art in the country because our kids here, just like we were fabulous, they fabulous still. Listen, they still fabulous. They still are. They can still write. They can still dance. They can still write, make music. I mean, my son plays by ear. Like he don't. I'm making him, forcing him to learn theory, but he can play almost anything just out of his. It's in his, the water. Body. It's, it's in the water. There's a lot of other shit in the water that doesn't belong there, but talent, uh, talent in the water, water in the chair. But we need like us, people like us to go back. Like it meant so that for me to walk into that classroom and for them to say, hey, I'm a poet. I went to Cody and I've been all over the world, like with poetry, like literally all over South Africa, all over America, all over Europe, all over South America. And I did that with poems and I write about us and I write about you. Wow. And like, wow. there's nothing more powerful than that, you know, but they need to be putting us in the curriculum. They need to be t telling, t showing up, like showing, talking about the work that you do in theater, talking about Nikki, the work you do in the music industry. Like they should be including us in the curriculum so the kids can look at people that went to these schools and say, I'm one of them. I could be like them. And um, absolutely. 
The, the, so the kids are fantastic. Ain't nothing wrong with the kids. There's a lot wrong with the, with the system that doesn't provide what they need, you know, so they can yeah. be excellent. So and 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 you know, white people, th- mm. that is an example of systemic racism. It started with the man who said, "I'm not going to pay more money for y'all to ship more niggas into." So now students mm. are dodging the roof, falling in on their heads. Yeah, that's a true story. Mice. Um, yes. Yeah. Mice. Absolutely. Mice. Mm-hmm. Yes. So you can't focus. The worst thing we had to look forward to was somebody from 1973 that we had their book. Because, you know, right. it was like all they yeah. are in the back. Uh, Eric, <laughs> education yes. was obviously something that you took very seriously in high school. Um, Absolutely. What would you say to the kid that's like, I want to be a journalist. I want to be a writer. I want to share work that empowers people, but I don't see the resources in front of me? What kind of advice would you give to a young kid in that space? Well, things that we learned in high school is that our resources were different than the kid that went to Farmington Hills or Livonia. Because keep in mind, we were fortunate that we did things like drama or journalism or academic games, things of that nature, where we were allowed to go to other schools and Mm -hmm. see how the other half lived. So that when we got to go into high schools that actually had carpet in them, full computers in every classroom, you know, food that actually looks like food in the lunchroom, (laughs) you know, it it, it kind of woke you up to a different set of reality. Like I said, I was fortunate because I was in honors classes. So Mm -hmm. we had the opportunity to do things that, you know, basic Cody student A couldn't. So we learned things about that. And then, of course, when you go to Eastern and you learn that, Every kid there is one of the smartest kids in their school. And, you know, there's different definitions of smart and different definitions of, uh, you know, who knows what. You have to catch up quick to yeah. understand, you know, OK, yeah. I need to change this up a little bit. Mm. I go from, you know, being a smart kid that had to study every now and then to being basic kid A that had to study a lot just to keep up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, Eric. I mean, mm-hmm. can, I, can I just say, can I just speak to that? Like, that's still a problem Absolutely. in such a big way right now because they push our babies through. And so right. you, they, we might get them to Wayne State. We might get them some money to go to U of M if they're decent. But are they going to stay? And, like, right. getting them to be able to finish and not be overwhelmed by that. My first year at Michigan State, I was devastated. I was overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. It was 200, 300 white kids in a class, and I was a number. And I was like, this was not I never should have gone to that school. I should have been at a liberal arts school. I should have been the new school for social research, you know. But I want to just speak to one thing, Nikki, about Detroit, but why I'm sending my son now to a Detroit public school. Yes, absolutely. It's because the thing that I he has not gotten from these white institutions, these white Catholic schools he's been at, and he was at Friends first, and he's been in a homeschool environment, is that he hasn't got the love. And Ooh. and that's like my son is gonna be fine because I'm educating King at home. He's he's gonna be fine. I ain't worried about his math, science, English. We ain't worried about none of that. What I'm worried about is if my son's spirit is safe when I when I drop him off. Right. Can I can right. I go on the road and know that during the day nobody is trying to destroy my son si- my son. And oh, wow, yeah. and that's been my struggle as a mother raising the son this boy by myself is trying to find a way to make sure that he's safe. That's that's safe from gun violence, safe from teachers and administrators who don't love him. And I think I got we got love at Detroit public schools. And I think that some of that is actually still there. You know, I actually want to speak on something else if I could for a minute. Uh, I always have been concerned about the fact that, as you know, you become an adult, you realize that most of these kids aren't set up to succeed because a lot of things that we should learn before we become adults are not required learning. Ooh. I mean, so much is like your finances and yeah. uh, learning what a mortgage is, learning how right. bank accounts work, learning the stock market, you know, Parenthood. basically learning learning uh, what the percentage is on a, a credit card, things of that nature. But then suddenly you go to college and all that's thrust into your face and, you know, next thing you know, you're in all type of debt and have all this misunderstanding yeah. of what you yeah. should have knew before you even got there. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, you know what's interesting? Another thing that I discovered in that research that I was doing was um, a representative from some civil organization in D.C. came down in 87. Um, no, 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 2008. 
2008, and talked about Detroit public schools and Cody in particular being ground zero as it relates to the educational issues. But they also talked about the fact that if you have parents who are not educated or who are not informed in those areas, how is it possible that they'll be able to pass that down to us? And if you have Mm. teachers who don't give a shit about Mm. making sure that we have those qualities, where do children Mm. get it? Right? Right. So to your point about being a mom, Jessica, and wanting to make sure that your child is protected, right? And not just from gun violence or the kids in in the schools but also the teachers. I have to bring this up. Um, and, and I was given permission to, to share this. So um, Dwayne Barnes hey, is buddy. my Shout brother, my friend. Um, y'all know we've been th- tight as ever, forever, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Um, Dwayne Absolutely. was gonna be, he was considering being a part of this conversation because Dwayne and I did the film Social Conflict and Social conflict is centered around all the different issues that students have to deal with. Um, it was a it was a short that we did when I just got fed up about the gun violence in the schools and when conversations about guns in schools started to come mm-hmm. up, right? And the reason I yeah. became so frustrated is because I know that um, arming teachers, especially teachers like some of the ones that we had, could be right. the worst thing in the entire world for yeah, students. Yeah. I'm going mm-hmm. to say yes. this, and I don't want to make y'all cringe. But I'm going to say it because it makes me angry. It breaks my heart. And if he was here, I would say it to his face. So y'all know we were in the Coraliers and as well as drama. We were singing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the movie is the short is based loosely on Dwayne's story, which was that Tillis motherfucking Butler, <laughs> who everybody but. thought was the nicest, kindest, gentlest creature on earth, mm. Mm. molested Dwayne. Oh and wow. several other students. Several. I did not know that. Yeah. And Dwayne has struggled his whole life at trying to figure out how to make sense of how a person who could take the one gift that God gave him mm. as a possibility to move on and to, to make wonderful, amazing things happen to him and take advantage of that and use yeah. that to take advantage of him. And I remember he'd have these sleepovers and the, and the girls would sleep upstairs and the boys would sleep downstairs. And our parents were like, okay, you know what? It should be okay. All the rest of the kids are going to, it'll be fine. And that is where he did his dirty, rotten ass deeds. Wow. Right? wow. So, yeah. So mm. there was also an incident five years prior that I've researched in the news where a student Mm. said a teacher was sexually harassing them or sorry, sexually assaulted them. The teacher went to court and the teacher got off. And this was Mm. like 79 or 80 or some shit like that. Mm. So Mm. in addition to having to compete with the streets and the shootings at McDonald's and the kids dying in the pool and us going to school the next day, like everything is fine and not getting any help for that trauma, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we're saying, oh, it was so much better when we were in school, when in Mm -hmm. fact, it was some bullshit then too. And absolutely. And my mission, like Jessica said, is to just create the awareness. We can't go back in time as much as I would like to grab him out of his grave and shake the shit out of him and put him back yeah. where he, where, you know. But we cannot go back. So let me ask you, Meech, mm. yeah. um, being a, you know, young man who was struggling with your sexuality, can you imagine what it would have been like to have been, you know, victimized by a teacher that you trusted that way? God. And I, have I'm... there ever been moments where you were challenged in that way? I am thankful that my high school experience did not take me down that road where I was dealing with teachers. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh Uh-oh. That's not true. He was a paraprofessional. He worked in the bookstore. Y'all remember Mr. Miller that worked in the bookstore? No. Okay. He He was about, what, maybe Dwayne's height, he was a very handsome, brown-skinned man. He was gay, but he 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 clocked well, he clocked me, honey, and and carrying on. So every time I would come in the bookstore, he would give me extra pencils and extra pads. Of, you know, we we had to buy. Remember how how we bought the paper, honey, in the stats between the the little blue the separator the blue separator. So that was a mm-hmm. poorest right. in America. You got to buy paper and pencils. Exactly. 
we uh, so he would give me an extra pack of paper and this and this that, and the other and he was always 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 you know making double uh, saying stuff that was double entendre but it was gay double entendre you know to me to clock me you know oh i got to go give me some bird today honey and this that, and another mm -hmm. and you know i was already going out to the clubs at that particular time so i knew what he was talking mm -hmm. but you know he slowly but surely was trying to to groom me in that regard and I was precocious because my hormones were raising. You know, I'm a precocious teenager, but I never had taken him up on, on that particular offer. So I didn't have that to contend with. Um, as and maybe it was because you were already in your I was already out and, open. and you were bigger. And, and you, but yeah. Mr. Butler was a psychologist. He had a psychology degree as well. So right. Dwayne talks about all the grooming that yeah. happened with him. Yeah, too. yeah. And and I I being a part of the men's ensemble, see there was myself, there was um oh god I I almost had his name because uh, Marcus Miller was uh, Philip Ruffin that's his name Philip Ruffin I was gonna say was it Phil Ruffin mm -hmm. uh uh he claimed that they were cousins but I don't know if they were I don't know if they were uh, biological cousins or not but they had a strong relationship and I knew being in the men's ensemble. There were there were instances, you know, it was it was certain touches or whatever. And I, I can't think of this one student's name, but I remember all the time when when Tiller was telling us how to breathe from our diaphragm. Oh yeah, well see that's what Dwayne said. I'm sorry, let me take. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It, it mm -hmm. was the way how he would touch us. You want to? Yeah. It was it was the way how he would touch us. And I remember one particular student. It was the way how Phil, Tillers went up to him. And he would touch him and the guy would look out the window. And I know that look. I know that look. That look was, oh, my God, you're touching me again. Yeah. You know, I know that look. But I, I didn't say anything mm -hmm. because, you know, he was one of the tough boys or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I and just he thought. he had that little room. Remember the little dark room? Yeah, the little, yeah, the little yeah, room yeah. with the tinted and window. Why were those windows room. dark? That's Why were we those were. windows in that mm -hmm. room tinted? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. exactly where we were. So, you know, I I just could not fathom mm -hmm. any anything else going on because I was already being tormented. See, being out and being gay, and, and then I became the replacement. I don't know if many of y'all remember one arm one arm Bernard, and I I say it like that because oh, yeah. remember he graduated. Yeah. He, he had graduated, and so I became his quote unquote successor. I became the new openly gay person that was there that everybody talked about and pointed at and this that, and the other. And so I was dealing with all of that and I just could not imagine having to have to deal with teachers and everything else on top of it. As yeah. I said earlier, I was already dealing with having to fight the football team and having to, to mm -hmm. go at the basketball team. And because I was friends with a lot of the girls that they wanted to, to talk to or whatever, that became a problem. So the drama department and and um, the story had that was my outlet. That was my release. Yeah. That was my everything there, and I was able Thank to do something constructive with it outside of dealing with with the, with the turmoil of what life was given. Plus, I was living in Herman Garden Projects at the time, child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I get it. And, that. and, and, and that's the thing. A lot of us had struggles at home. So yeah. thank God, Miss Story, Miss Presnell, again, those teachers who cared. There are other teachers in the school who cared, but they, we're talking about the ones specifically who impacted our lives. Thank God Absolutely. they cared. Thank God. I remember Miss Story took us to Rosedale Park to her beautiful Remember home. that? Uh, yes. So, you know what I mean? So that we could see yeah. something different. Uh, um, yeah, right. Things that were aspirational, right? So... We're going to come off the doom and gloom. I, I'm, I, I know I shocked the shit out of y'all with the Tillis Butler situation, but Absolutely. it's something that has been going mm -hmm. on for a very long time. And Sad. I just want to say, wow. if there are people out there, alum, mm -hmm. who have been victims of Mr. Butler and the dirty, mm -hmm. rotten, nasty, awful things he did, um, mm -hmm. don't leave a brother that's willing to talk about it out there alone. Right, because right, right. there's some kid right now in school mm -hmm. that is suffering that same kind of abuse or worse, and they're afraid Ooh. that they're gonna talk about it and they're gonna stand alone in it. Right, right. And, I, and my heart aches for my friend because mm. you know I look at his situation, I look at Sarah Stokes' situation. I did a documentary film on her father sexually assaulting her for years, 
And both Sarah and Dwayne have a really hard time talking about the films now or participating in things as it relates to the film and, and, and promoting it and letting people know that it's there because they have felt sort of slapped in the face because it's just like, okay, if it's not a big R. Kelly thing and it's not on Lifetime and a bunch of stars aren't attached exactly. to it, nobody exactly. gives a shit. So right. I'm well, asking um, if you have been the victim of sexual assault, molestation, number one, call a crisis hotline, talk to someone, an adult, a friend, or somebody. And if you um, in specific, in particular were at Cody and you were held, you were a victim of Mr. Butler or any teacher for that matter, speak up about it because you don't want the person brave enough to speak up about it, to stand alone and suffer that um, exactly. alone. Like maybe y'all, and, and you don't have to speak up about it publicly. Even if you reached out to Dwayne, <laughs> he's gonna kill me for saying this like you don't be asking people to come. but y'all understand what I'm saying like don't leave the brother um, to, to yeah. out there like that right. I have a feeling that it happened to a lot of people so enough of the doom and the gloom mm. media, poetry journalism acting, music, TV film, all of those things are so powerful as it relates to the narratives in our community yeah. right? Uh and the messaging that they include. So Jessica, your yes. book, yeah. We yeah. Want Our Bodies Back. What you talking about, girl? <laughs> <laughs> I have it. I'm gonna do you one I even have... better. While you tell us what it's about, I'm gonna put the cover right back up here, right next to you. There we it's go. It's all good. Yeah, We Want Our Bodies Back. Um, it's my fifth book. Um, it's the, I'm the first black woman poet to be published by HarperCollins. Um, since Gwendolyn Ooh. Brooks, this is a really oh, big deal. Oh, girl. Um, yeah, I'm really proud of yeah. it, you know. Yes. And you know, thank you. I've been independent, independently publishing um, myself and other poets with through more Black press since 1997. So making the decision with my agent, who was trying to working on selling my memoir, I told her to to pull back and to focus on uh, a poetry book. If I was gonna give a book to a more mainstream. Um, you know, large publishing house that there had to be a poetry book first. And I'd done too many, too much foundational work with poetry and with that audience building to not give my book this. And that, and the reason why I decided to go with HarperCollins, I'm a size because I needed, we want our bodies back to be in the hands of black girls everywhere, girls mm -hmm. and women everywhere, men too. But it just really focused on making sure that they could get to it more easily. And the pandemic, you know, I had a huge tour <laughs> set up for March and April. I, I lost like, Girl, I can't even about. count <laughs> the amount of money that I lost. And, you know, you know March is my is a big Women's History Month and April's National Poetry Month. So, you know, um, but what has happened that's beautiful is that I shifted to virtual and been doing virtual bookstores, virtual book tours with book independent, Black-owned, woman-owned, revolutionary bookstores that I wouldn't be able to get to in, like, Albuquerque and different other towns that weren't on my tour schedule. So it's been a blessing. And um, and the book is doing really well. And I'm proud of it. But We Want Our Bodies Back, the title poem is Passandra Bland, who was murdered by police. So it's about uh, a lot of the poms are about women. Um, and I think it's a, some people get the get it misinterpret the work, and that's fine. But it's not about what men are supposed to, how men are supposed to treat us. It's about how we're supposed to treat ourselves. And um, yeah, it's about how we it's about it's about loving ourselves and, and understanding the power that we have and that we want our bodies back is like it's a declaration. It's like women saying we're tired and we want our children back and our culture back and our bodies back. And it became something even deeper with COVID-19. You know, I, I live here in Detroit, so I've lost a lot of friends to COVID-19. A lot of my friends have lost family members. And so it's been a real difficult time here. Um, and just because, you know, the reason why we're losing so many people in our community is because of the lack of health care, because of how inadequate this country takes care of um, poor folks and um, doesn't. You know, we're not always our communities are just not raised up in the same way where we have access to the things that we need, like just information, like all the things that people went to go get for like uh, their health, I already had in my kitchen. That's like my natural way of wow. living. Right. I got right. And apple cider vinegar and, you know what I'm saying? Like black seed oil. I was Are like, you vegan, hey, Jessica? Good. Vegetarian, yeah. Okay. No, <laughs> not vegan. I'm not that, I'm not that good. I like right. cheese and chocolate. So <laughs> I'm not that good. So, you gotta have something. 
Yeah. Well, King has been vegetarian his whole life, but we uh, he wants to eat wild caught salmon and tuna. So we, he's he's leaning toward more being a pescatarian and he's a teenager. So I'm, I'm letting him have his way with it. Um, so we eat, I'll eat some fish, wild caught fish with him every once in a while. So, yeah, I mean, so we've been we let, I mean, a clean diet, gut health, real good. You know what I mean? And that's that's how we stay healthy, you know. So and um, so we got to but it's it's environmentally we're set up to fail in that way. Um, but so we want our bodies back is about taking all of that back and reclaiming our power. And the poems are very personal. You know, I got poems about my daddy, who's a big influence on me. Poems about going to Ferguson, a poem called I Can't Breathe. Interesting enough oh. about being being on the ground in Ferguson with my friend Talib Kweli and Rosa Clemente is a African Puerto Rican uh, activist badass and 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 being on the ground there because I did a, I do a lot of work in jails and prisons too and so oh. for seven years I did a program called Prison Performing Arts which I would love inside um, St. Louis juvenile detention centers and and so I love the kids in St. Louis so when I saw Ferguson happen I I couldn't look at it on TV I had to go I remember there. there yeah yeah uh, and it was traumatizing. I mean, they they had us on the ground. I'm talking about peaceful protesting with AR-15s at our backs. And it was just a, a real eye-opening experience. And so, you know, I'm, I see what's happening now. You know, so I'm writing I Can't Breathe then from, you know, like Eric Gardner, Mike Brown. And then here we have George Floyd. Then, you know, then we have Breonna Taylor, which are not, yeah. not enough outrage for our sister Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky. Like, you know, because when black women and girls get killed, we don't have outrage. And some of the some of the movement is so male centered that you forget that girls and women <laughs> get killed by police, too. Um, wow. And so that's the book is, you know, but it is a book of joy. And it's, so it's not just gloom and doom. It's also a book of like, you know, understanding that we have power and that we can make our way out of this. Um, the, but the, I'm real proud of the book. It's my, my book, but it's, it's a strong one. And I hope y'all get it. We're trying to... I love the title. I love the cover. I'm going to yeah. buy a copy. Um, in fact, I'm going to buy two copies and I'm going to give it to somebody who's watching She Speaks Live um, just because we have to patronize and support each other. Jess, I'm, I'm so proud of you for that. And Thanks. Also, I'm going to go a step mm -hmm. farther with it. Once I read this book, I'm going to call you because I think oh, that yeah. this is very important for us to talk about like we did for Color Girls. Remember, we did for Color Girls. Listen, how yes. is it that I was exposed to four Color Girls who have considered uh, suicide when the rainbow is not enough to uh, a white mm -hmm. woman? What, and do a, at a Detroit public school. At a I mean, Detroit public saying, school. Like, <laughs> it changed you my life. And I and, 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 I talk about that, like if any book that I've been in, any anthology, people ask me, I've talked about Susan's story, who came to my choreo poem premiere last year, who came, she was there. Like this is my drama teacher from high school. She was at my premiere of my techno choreo poem. And Itazaki Shange wow. was my friend, right? Who passed away Woo. a couple of days Woo. before my birthday. And so for Woo. me to like be introduced to Itazaki's work at high school and then for her to become someone that knows my work um, and, and get to read, I've read with her, countless times in New York City and, and in Florida and, and all over the place. And right before she died, two weeks, a few weeks before she passed, I got to spend some time with her, a weekend with her in Miami. Right. She was amazing. Her and Mama Sonia Sanchez and the last poets. And um, But she loved my work and she loved the poem, We Want Our Bodies Back. She talked about it on on social media. And so, you know, and and Itazaki wasn't like somebody where like, I wasn't geeked out to be on the phone with her. Like Sonia Sanchez is like my mama, my friend, but Intazaki used to be on the phone. She'd be like, Jessica, I need to tell you something. I used to be like, oh, Intazaki Shange is on the phone. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, that's like, like, like Chris called. And I was like, oh. yeah. Like, and so, but Cody High School and, and that drama and the Chief Days Arc gave me that opportunity. And I was I was a year before y'all, so I wasn't in for Color Girls, Nikki. I watched y'all do it. I was sitting there like, what right. is this? And so when you get the book, you're going to bug out how many poems I got for Intazaki. The book is dedicated to her. Um, <sighs> it's, yeah, the opening poem is like, it says for Intazaki. I mean, it's, you know, it's because she is the, you know, she's the one. She's the one that made it possible for me to hear language so gangster, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, it says, in memory and celebration of Intazaki Shange, I told you I would not exist if not for you. You replied, What's a girl to say? I'm honored. I mean, you know, what's the girl to say? I mean, she's. I went to her wow. funeral in DC. Mm. Dressed in a long red train. <laughs> Cause, 
We all dressed in the. I was a woman in red at the funeral. We all dressed in color. Oh my! Oh God! Oh God! How powerful was that poem? No, 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 stop! Oh, how powerful was that? Okay, y'all taking me back. I'm just sitting here thinking about like the impact of art on our Mm. lives. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and do you know, Nikki, that, I, I mean, I think um, Demetrius might know Aku Kudogo, but the sister that, that directed and choreographed my, my techno choreo poem, Salt City, is Aku Kudogo. She's the woman in yellow from the original cast. Ah, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so she, you oh, know, wow. working, you know, the, 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 the people who created the piece, you know, are, is now Ooh. directing me. So, wow. yeah. Wow. I'm real blessed. Yeah, and that's that's, really, that's really why good. it's so important. Um, you know, I've learned so much in my career and just about how much of our culture is missing from mainstream oh. television and film. Come on. How much yeah, of work is not seen by our youth. How I mean the fact like we wear the mask that grins and lies and hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. Like where is that today? Yeah. yeah. I know why the cage verse where is yeah. that art today? Yeah. There's so this. much great art that is omitted from okay. entertainment and media and it's unfortunate. And it's, it's all really purpose. unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> what you what? say what Jess? It's on purpose, you know. Yes. They, they, they dumb, they dumb I, I was going to, to go there because you said education and racism in our education. Yes. Um, what we have done over the years is that in our fight for equality, some of us have gotten tired to push the educational piece because we have allowed for smart TV, smartphones and everything to come through. We have allowed for them to tell us that our kids are ADHD and we have accepted that. We have allowed for education not to be the commodity that it once was because we have allowed the hustle to be what it is. You know, a lot of our kids and a lot of our babies are seeing our parents struggle. They know what it is to come up with with meager or or below meager means of carrying on. And so we have allowed the hustle to become, and the school of hard knocks, if you will, to become our educational uh, 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 format or our educational foundation. Because now what what we have attributed all that to do is to to give us uh, some kind of litmus test to your masculinity or your femininity, to Mm -hmm. your hardness. You know, we have allowed all that to describe what manhood is. We have said that that we have allowed this society to tell us that going to prison is a rite of passage for our kids. So they can get- Well, it's the school school to prison pipeline. I mean, the reason why I like to your point, they do the shit on purpose so that you don't- See? It was a 78% dropout rate in- in, in, 83 or something. It's crazy. And, absolutely. And it part of that, too, when they took out, remember when we had Woodshop at Cody? How many of y'all remember that? Right. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Woodshop, yes. I remember that. Woodshop class, and we had the, the metal shop. We yeah. had yeah. Yeah. we had Junior Achievement. We yeah. had all those things that were yeah. there that everybody could get in where they fit in. Okay, we had we had the arts. We had theater. We had journalism. We had the core leaders and choir and all of that. Some of us had, we had marching bands. We had marching, and marching bands. Band. Yeah, we had have marching bands. As, as, as a means of, of expression. Those who went into sports with Mr. Menifee and carrying on and, and yeah. got that. Oh, Menifee, yes. Ah, yeah. right. but we had that. Then we had the shop classes. We had DECA and Junior Achievement. We had wood shop and metal oh, and all of those things to where those who were good with their hands and good with their skills. And, you know, we had that so that they can feel that they were a part of something, too, and that their oh, yeah. gifts were, were, were harnessed and they were absolutely manifesting. But when they yeah. took all that okay. out, when, mm-hmm. when they fought Dr. Bomb, when, when, when Ms. Story was fighting oh. with the teachers, with Dr. Bomb, uh, for, uh, uh, right. because they went up against her to Dr. Bomb, who was the principal at the time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and they were fighting because of what she was doing with us. Was well, she taking these kids out of class? They're going to the newspaper. They're going, what? Right. They got right. me, right. Dwayne, Wendy, 
uh, what was it? Mean Dwayne, Wendy, Darlene all got scholarships to college. Yes. I Hello. missed a math class, would not have been able to get my scholarship. This lady came and put, picked me up and took me to Henry Ford Community College and enrolled me in summer program to take the math class so I could graduate and go to college. And How these teachers that? fought her How about for that? saving yeah. lives. Yeah, yeah. Black yeah. lives. Yeah. And, and yeah. here's the thing. When we talk about racism, and it's interesting that the two teachers, and they were sister friends themselves, uh, Ms. Story and Ms. Presnell. Presnell, yeah. yeah. They, were. they were sister yes, friends. Absolutely. Uh, and, 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 and then they looked alike, too. That was, that was sure a, <laughs> Remember Ms. Presnell was bodybuilder? She yeah, could take yeah. little vitamin C. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And what that was, was they came in as two Caucasian women, mm-hmm. and they did something that the other women... I won't say didn't want to do, but I don't think they they knew how to empower themselves to do it. And I'm going to go out on a limb with this because some would debate and argue and say, oh, well, that was their white privilege and they were able to do this because we came in. We've been trying to do this, but we couldn't. No, because what y'all did was, what y'all did was, y'all was so, so quick to sit down there and say, I got mine. You got to get yours. Versus coming in and doing the nurturing that was needed. There were there were a few. There were a few yes. teachers that would stay behind and would do yes. lesson plans there at school. They would stay behind if you needed to to uh ask questions for your homework or didn't get the lesson. Right. There were a few. Uh, but there yeah, were uh, uh, Mr. Mrs. Archer as some of those teachers yeah, also. Yeah, I yeah. Oh, Mr. Archer. Yeah, Mr. Love Mr. Archer. Them. <laughs> the, Love the, Mr. Teacher, the math teachers. Yeah. The math teachers. Oh He's God. Yeah. Miss Tolliver. Miss Tolliver was a bomb. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's they were just so right. We got to make sure we acknowledge the good teachers. There were other yeah. good black teachers in that school as yeah, well. I think Absolutely. the point of it is just when we start talking about, there was this thing going around with white people saying, I take responsibility. I take responsibility, right? I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's all over. Yes. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I just want them to understand that taking responsibility goes so deep. It's so large, right. Right? right? You know, you got to right. really know what you're taking responsibility for. And Lord, when I see us right. out in the streets, initially my response to all of this, um, the protesting was, no, 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 no. You got provocateurs. You got Antifa. You got no, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. And then I realized um, my idea on, on protesting evolved into something that made me realize that you need all of it. You need to burn yeah. shit down and you need somebody who is more proactive than reactive and you need someone who's planning and strategizing. But that is um, the, the reason I was so concerned about where we were headed with this protesting and the violence is because I understand that the root of a lot of our problems is in what is happening in the educational system right now. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we need to be, our children need to be educated so that they too can become doctors and nurses and politicians and law Mm -hmm. enforcement officers Mm -hmm. and judges and all of these people that are eventually going to change this shit. Because exactly. it's not right. going to change you know overnight. What? We have got to educate our youth. They deserve mm-hmm. a fighting chance. We got all these right. celebrities and athletes and people who have made all this money and who are hugely successful. Mm-hmm. I'm denouncing my celebrity shit. Because if it means that I can't speak the truth and speak truth to power and talk about the shit that really goes on and that re- same recycled dead ass narrative, one dimensional monolithic views of black women, if I can't talk the real shit about that, then kiss my nah. whole entire ass. Yeah, yeah. I don't need it. Because we have girl. got to do better. We mm-hmm. have got to do better. And it starts with educating our kids and right. giving them a chance and ending the systemic yeah. racism and the redlining and taxes paying for schools and roofs falling in, yep. and kids My being bad. molested and raped and shot and killed and dying in swimming pools and not getting help for the trauma. Right. I want to I want to put a challenge out there mm-hmm. because oftentimes, and I say this to all my power to the people children, because mm-hmm. that th- th- they strike a nerve with me because I always hear, okay, y'all need to be woke, y'all need to be woke. But when you wake mm-hmm. up, what do you do, honey? After you wake up, yeah. you get action that's behind it. Okay, there's action. When you get up, you go pee, you go brush your teeth, you put your clothes on, you eat your breakfast, you go outside to do what? To go to work, to go wherever. There's something yeah. to do after you wake up. And I'm going to put a challenge out here because we keep saying we know the educational system is fucked. 
But now I want those who have the means, those of you who say we need better education, write the textbooks. Whatever is missing right. that they're not teaching, where are the textbooks? Right. Where mm -hmm. are our people who say, okay, this is what's missing, and you create a history book? Where is the itinerary? Where mm -hmm. is the curriculum that well, we, we, need the, we can We have to write the curriculum. Yes, yeah. we have. We, and yeah. we're going to control the narrative, and we're going to say that we have to educate our children. We are, mm -hmm. And then educate one another. Where yeah. are the, the the textbooks? Well, the things right. when we're talking about defunding police, you know, Demetrius, we like we have to like nobody wants to hear defund police, but like, I like to fund the education system too because the education system is not working. They no, need to absolutely. take the money that they're using and reallocate funds, and they need to like start over. How we need to start fresh with policing and what the idea of policing is. We have to start fresh with what education looks like for our kids, exactly. and like giving them over to the the other culture. Like, there's only so many Susan stories and Miss Presnells, okay. Like, it's like they're very they're gems. They're not the right. norm. Though they, they were yeah. extraordinary. They, they, okay, they were the so exception, not, not the rule. Come on now, I wish they weren't, but that is the exception, and we were blessed to be able to get in contact with some exceptional teachers. But it's Absolutely. not the rule. I know because my son has been, and I've been paying for, <laughs> I've been paying for his, <laughs> paying that? for you know the yeah. undoing that I have to do when I when he leaves these schools. You know the my un. Friend. The unpacking I have to do and the lifting up I have to do to make sure my son knows that he's excellent, right? right? So, no, we have, but we have to write, because I'm doing, King has curriculum from me, right? right, I, right. I get extra things to do, because I told him they can get you to college, but I'm getting you to manhood. Right. So, we need to get our children to right. manhood, right, into womanhood, not just to college, because college ain't for everybody, yeah. but right. how do we come, how do we Build strong men and strong black men and strong black exactly. women. That, that's why I also say they need to have classes and you know workshops, what have you, that teach real life application. Because like you said, everybody's not going to go to college. Right. Most of the people that's out here working now, they don't have any type of college degree, or they have a college degree like myself, and end up doing something entirely different. Because right, right, right. you don't learn right. that until after you get out of school, what yeah, you right. might have really been good at. To, to, right. Kids need to be taught to uh, not taught. Kids need to be inspired and led to um, the things that inspire them and that they're passionate right. about and the things that they want exactly. to. Because imagine if we weren't able to discover our love for writing, our love for journalism, mm. our love for music. Imagine if it was just, no, Jessica, care more. You are right. supposed to be a right. bean counter, right. ma'am. <laughs> Understand that you or or, or Eric, you're going to build this car or meet you're going to, you know what I mean? Imagine right. if we didn't have mm -hmm. um, the ability to have someone help us discover that passion yeah. and tap into that. And Black kids, um, a lot of us are geniuses that are so never discovered. Come on. A lot of us have the ability, whether it's you can take a car apart, put it back together, whether you, you know what I mean? Black folks mm -hmm. just got the sauce and the magic. Exactly. And we exactly. need to be led to discovering it. Um, and we children. Also have to you let it I mean? breathe. We have to let it breathe because oftentimes we take our babies because they could do something very well. Mm -hmm. We think that's what they should be doing, but that may not be what their gift is or where their passion lies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to let it breathe, just like you do with wine. When you uncork wine and carry mm -hmm. on, you have to let it breathe in order for it to, to live. You yeah. know, and that's mm -hmm. what we have to do with wow, our babies. The wow, the irony. Breathe. Mm -hmm. Oh, how about that? Yes. Because the next, okay, because because so for so long they mm. have not been able to. Now, who's been stifling them? What knee has right. been on their neck for all this time? Has it been only yeah. society? Has it been circumstances? Has it been parents who've been trying to vicariously live through their children and press their issues onto their kids? Mm. Yeah. You know what has it been? A children, our kids. They are our legacy, darling, but they have their own lives to live. Okay. Yes, we are. And they're going to lead us, the, the youth will be the ones that lead us to the promised land. How about that? Yes, it's going to take How about that? a young lifetime to set this shit straight. Y'all, we are at 60 whole minutes. And <laughs> I'm just like, damn. 
But this cannot be the end <laughs> of this conversation. Um, yeah. This cannot be the end of this conversation. Uh, we have got to continue it. I want to have these often. Um, I think having these think tanks and, and these opportunities to share information is the only way that we're going to figure this thing out. I will say yeah. that I think that teachers need to be paid more. I think that teachers need to be trained better. Um, Absolutely. And I think this, that whatever it is we have to do to make school more appealing or education more appealing to our students who don't have a cr incredible parents like Jessica, and you know what I mean, and so many who are actively involved in their kids' educational lives. And, and mm -hmm. Eric, I don't know, I didn't even ask you if you had babies or not. Um, no, I, I do not, actually. I not, do not tutor right. some kids. Yeah. Is this this grown man? Is that King? <laughs> oh my God, yeah, you're so handsome. Like Look at hey, you. Up, Wait a minute, hold on. Let me get to the phone. Oh Look at you, man. Was your mom, beautiful. listen. <laughs> listen Thank when I tell you. Your mama, baby, your mama loves her some you. We're your mom's old friends Hello. from high school. Hello. We old people. <laughs> we are very old people. And we're talking about kids like you kids that are a lot less fortunate than you oh, and trying nice to make it. the world a better place for y'all. Because at the end Absolutely. of the day, it's a lot going on and we know that y'all need us to fight hard. I know you got, your mama is a warrior. Your mama, okay. I don't know if you know how much of a warrior your mama is. I guess you know better than anybody because you came from her, but your mama is a warrior <laughs> and she got warrior friends. Right. And we're working on some some things to help make life better for a lot of kids. Exactly. Absolutely. So, he, he, Incredible young poet. He's the youngest night arts winner in history to win our night art fifteen thousand dollar grant when he was nine years old for. Oh, his... now. Yeah. What's the name of your program? Um, the Twelve and Under Super Cool Poetry Open Mic. I don't know what that voice is. That deep voice. I don't know what that. The Twelve and Under <laughs> Super Cool Girl, Poetry Open Mic. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me your website. Oh, the website is supercoolpoetry.com. Supercoolpoetry.com. Well, listen. Hey, I want to thank y'all from the bottom of my heart for being a part of this conversation. It um, it's therapy when you can talk to other people, and, and, and especially people who came from where you came from, educated yeah. the same place you were educated. Absolutely. And it's a beautiful thing that we've all been successful in life mm, due to the fact that we were some fighting ass colored mm, folks. This is <laughs> <laughs> we were some fighting black people. Yes, and yeah. we were not giving I mean, it up, right? This is what something we, was in the water, Cody. We did, we did all right. Absolutely. Uh, no, we did we better did than our money. Right. We That's did better than all right. Overcomer. So, real quick plug um, what you got going on, where we can find y'all, and we're going to wrap it up. So, Meech, okay. where can we find you, baby? What you got going on, right quick? Where okay, Eric, that's on you. I'm sorry, I'm on Eric. Eric. Okay. Well, yeah, keep keep in mind as I'm waiting to find out what happens in this pandemic and what my next move is. I'm still doing my podcast, which is called Get Off My Lawn with me, Eric Buckner. I do it once a week and I talk about various issues involving Detroit and the world based on a person of a particular age's perspective and, uh, you know, how I feel about things and, you know, kind of give you a feel of, you know, what I think should be going on and try to gain some understanding from other people along the way. Mm. All right, all right, all right, all right. Big meat, what it do, baby? Baby, it do what I tell it to do. How about that? <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Listen, I am, um, we're, I am in the process of building my own network, Diversity TV, all and right. also uh, Black, G Black GDP TV, which stands for Gross Domestic Product, television is hosting the television version of Dishing Tea with Big Meats as well as the radio broadcast. But you can find out everything that we're doing over at DishingTea.com. And also you can join me every day with Atlanta Hot Radio with my co-host over there, DJ Smack and Aunt Nikki and the Big the big Guy Ally and, and uh, Easy Boss over at um, AtlantaHotRadio.com. You can find all the information there. Just go to DishingTea.com one-stop shop. All right, all right, all right. And Jessica Care More. Yes, so, so yeah, so my my book is my big thing right now. So you can find all information about me at jessicacaremore.com. I have a Tuesday night Instagram show. I've been bringing amazing artists. Nikki, I love to bring you on um every Tuesday at 7 with different artists talking about their careers. Um 
yeah, for my sisters, I work with the Black Women Rock and comedians and activists. And so, yeah, but Jessica care more on Instagram. I'm on Instagram pretty, pretty regularly. And so, um, but just, I appreciate you, Nikki. Thank you for bringing me on. And, and um, this conversation was really inspiring for me. And I hope we could do it again. Absolutely, uh, thank you we very can much. do it again. Sure. I want to say thank you to everybody who watched on Facebook, um, Instagram. Well, we're on our Instagram, I'm sorry. Facebook, SheSpeaksLive.com, NoEgo.TV, and Periscope. I appreciate y'all for, for watching these little stories unfold. I'm actually launching an initiative called Worth Women in Reality Films. This is film, yes. television content that is about okay. who we really are and changing the yes. narrative. So make sure you guys go to worthfilms.com. Jessica, you got to get on this movement yep. because your books be have got to be, listen, I got all kinds of ideas. And what you were talking about okay. doing with La Trope des Arts and that Cody High School, I'm 100% on Yes, I'm, right I'm here, like right with now. you, baby. Yeah, we need, to, we need to really uh, roll up our sleeves and just remind people of the greatness that once existed there. In addition to yeah. social yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. So, Dwayne Barnes, I love you, friend. Um, our movie, Shout out to Dwayne. <laughs> Go to socialconflictfilm.com. Thank you, Cody High School alum. I love y'all. Blessings to you and your family. Stay safe. Thank y'all for watching. She speaks live. Yeah. Ah. And this was the Cody High School Cody Times version. <laughs> All right. Good night. All right.